Oh, thanks. Oh, we're on. Woo! Yes. Wonderful. Lauren has been making. Oh, no, you missed one? Oh, sorry. Anybody not get one then? OK, good. The Mi Minnie Mouse didn't get you. Did everyone get Lauren's attire? I, I didn't. Rode was with her all morning and she tells me as we were walking in. I was like, oh, OK. Hear me okay? Do you need, do I need this? I feel like oh, I you're at the podium. Voice and, and talk loudly. All right. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to NatCon 2022. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Yay! Yes, let's see. we're here. We made it. Finally. <laughs> so I'm Siobhan Norris, and I am so happy to be here with my good friend and longtime colleague, Dr. Tina Atherall. So she is with Psych Armor. And you are here to learn about increasing military cultural competency among university administrators. Now, to give you a little context of how this partnership came about, um, I want to tell you I've been working with Dr. Atherall from, since about 2018. Um, I currently serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Military Affairs at Fayetteville State University, which is in North Carolina. It's about 10 miles away from Fort Bragg. We have the largest uh, military connected student enrollment of any HBCU. And um, Dr. Atherall and I go back, like I said, in 2018 when I worked, started off at UNC Wilmington out at the beach in North Carolina. And we had a really high number of military connected students. And I realized then and there that there was a significant gap in cultural knowledge. So while we had the buy in from middle level, individuals, meaning our, um, some of our faculty who may have been veterans themselves, uh, we didn't really necessarily have the full buy-in of our university administrators. And so therefore, understanding military cultural competency wasn't made a priority. And we know when that's not the case, our military students aren't given all of the necessary tools and resources that they need to be ultimately successful. So what I did is I went to Dr. Atherall and I said, hey, I really love your trainings. They're online, they're accessible 24 seven. And I think that we can really benefit from bringing your training to UNC Wilmington. So that was our test pilot and it worked phenomenally. At that point, our chancellor at the time created having military students as part of his strategic plan, of his five year strategic plan. That made a huge difference. At UNCW, we saw rapid growth. Um, we doubled our military student enrollment in two years. And we became the number one university in the state of North Carolina in 2018, ranked by Military Times. So it, it helps. I say that because it helps. And so we saw a lot of great initiatives um, being produced because we had the cultural understanding. And so then when I moved up to the UNC system based in Chapel Hill, I oversaw 16 universities and about 20,000 military connected students. At that time, only eight of our institutions um, were ranked by Military Times. And I got to thinking, what can we do better? How can we raise that number? How can we better serve our military connected students across our entire UNC system? Again, I reached out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Atherall. We created a, our own platform, and she can talk a little bit more about that later, but we selected five courses um, that were designed by uh, subject matter experts that we felt were going to be necessary for our university leaders across the 16 UNC system. And we saw great success with that as well. We saw that a lot more of our folks started joining our Military Affairs Working Group, which is a state group that is dedicated to serving military connected students across the UNC system. We started off with about 12 individuals and that, that number consistently grew over the three years that I was there. I'm now at my current job at Fayetteville State and it's kind of funny to me because I'm a veteran myself and I was a military spouse for 17 years and you know I've been in this industry for so long that I think that you know mostly everybody at this point should have some understanding of the military just a little bit right and that's a little bit of a um, ignorance on my part just because I've been in the, in the in the field for so long when I got hired at Fayetteville State I was advised to brief our cabinet our senior our senior level leaders on what it is that I wanted to do and how I was going to make the Chancellor's vision a success. 
So when I first went to this cabinet meeting, I said, I know that we're close to Fort Bragg. I know in the city of Fayetteville, everyone is touched by the military in some capacity. You can't throw a rock without hitting somebody that has something to do with the military, especially the Army. So I said, by a show of hands, how many people are connected to the military? A lot of them raised their hand. Well, yeah, thank you. We'll get to that, too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so I said, I said, by a show of hands, how many people are connected to the military? And mostly everyone raised their hands. And I said, OK, how well do you feel? How confident are you in understanding the military community? And one guy kind of went like this. And I was really surprised, because these are leaders in our university. Some have been there for 20-something years consistently serving our military-connected students, yet have no solid understanding of the military community in itself. So with that, like clockwork, I go back to Dr. <laughs> Atherall and I said, we got a partner again. And so luckily, I had the buy-in from Cabinet, I had the buy-in from the Chancellor, and he said, for four weeks, I want you to come and train at every Cabinet-level meeting about military cultural competency. And that's what I did. And I started off with 15 things that veterans want you to know. Because one, it, it's the cornerstone. And two, it's just a great place to start and it's really helpful. And we found that, you know, my chancellor, he, he cracked us all up. The first thing, um, number one, and I'm not going to give it away, the number one thing that veterans want you to know, my chancellor threw his hands up and he's like, well, I already messed that up. I'm done. I've messed up already. <laughs> so this is, it's, it's a really informative. Um, it's, it's not very long at all. It's 16 minutes long. The, the, one of the things I love about Psych Armor Platform is that it's accessible 24-7. It can support professional development for your university leaders. It can support professional development for yourself. But more importantly, university administrators need to have this cultural understanding because one, they set the tone. Two, they are the decision makers. And three, they influence policy. And when you are informed with this type of cultural awareness, you are going to help your military students succeed. You're going to see increase in enrollment. You're going to see an increase in retention. And you're going to see an increase in overall satisfaction. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Yay. Dr. Atherall. OK. And you're going to stay there, right? Because you need the speaker. But I get the clicker. Unless you want to sit, because I, I know it's whatever you want to do. How do you feel? Okay, whoop, I'm gonna have to not stand in my way. So hi everyone, so she set this up really well. Um, I already told you who I was. Uh, Psych Armor is a national nonprofit, so I'll give you that little caveat there. And what I hope that you'll do, because I'm gonna speak a lot to Psych Armor um, today, but what I want you to think about is how that's gonna be embedded in your work. That's who we're supposed to be, right? We're not a standalone. Um, we're not meant to be out there just uh, like as a website, like she mentioned, it can be used 24 hours a day. But I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the ways in which we've learned that implementing the training in your system or maybe even in your small groups can really change conversations in an in a impactful way. Shaban asked the question or said that she asked the question, how many individuals were connected to military? So let's test her. How many people here <coughs> are connected to the military? Surprise, right? Adele, raise your darn hand. <laughs> Adele is, we're gonna vouch for her. Um, how many of you are veterans yourself? Surprise. How many of you are family members? Can be the dual. Okay. Best friends? <laughs> Take care of their animals when they deploy, all of that. All right, wonderful. So we could make the assumption in this room that we don't need to have this conversation. I could make an assumption, which actually in the beginning of my work at Psych Armor, I did think, how will I ever talk about 15 things veterans want you to know with a room full of veterans? You're the experts. Well, I've learned a lot. So that's why I'm also gonna take us back at the beginning of this, this time together. And when Siobhan says going back to the basics and just asking that question and raising awareness, it has truly been um, a very important thing for me, even as, a, as the organization leader, to remind myself that even though all of you are connected, everybody has a different level of awareness, a different story. You're the most diverse community out there, right? And so to make some one blanket statement as well about the veteran community is very, very harmful. So 
instead being able to start a conversation that the military is a unique culture of its own, which you all know, is a really great place to start a conversation. So I ask this question here, what is veteran ready? And I bring this to your attention because if I was just to ask you that question, I'm gonna also make an assumption that many of you would say, oh, well that means, like the students in the room, that you're gonna be ready to get out there in the world and you're gonna know what the civilian life's like and your transition from now college campuses to, to your neighborhoods is gonna go well. That's not what I mean by veteran ready. What I mean by veteran ready is the majority of the work we do at Psych Armor, and that is organizations such as higher education institutions and administrators or veterans like yourself have come into this world and they're like, whoa. They say they have a veteran program, but they don't. They say they have a hiring structure, but oh my gosh, they don't know, number one. So organizations come to Psych Armor and they say, or how about this, military friendly, how many of you know all those badges? So what does that mean? If you peel it back, there's actually military-friendly programs out there that are marketing campaigns. All right, so here's veteran ready to me. First, we talk about the problem. All of you in school right now know you need to have a problem statement and then you're gonna come up with your solution. The problem statement that we used to define was that 7% of our, our um, American population have it served, now less than 1%. That means that the civilians don't know anything about your life, so therefore you're gonna have the worst experience ever, mental health, all these problems and challenges, right? Like that literally is this like drowning problem statement that's often used when it talks about supporting our military connected community. A military family member all the way back to my grandfather was in World War II, so I, I, that's very, very hard for me because I'm pretty darn awesome in terms of what I can contribute to my world. What is really the problem is yes, there is a divide from any community when we don't understand one another. So that military-civilian divide really wants to challenge us to say, yes, the military, all of you, or all of you that are connected, there is a different culture. And I don't even need to go into it in this room, but what we love to do is just raise the awareness that there is a cultural difference and that cultural competency that Shaban talked about is actually not just in one course. It's an entire systems change. Do you remember how she talked about leadership buy-in? She talked about programs that were developed and then also then doing the training in between. Cultural competency, how many times have you heard military cultural competent? That's not one course, right? It's not. You have to change a system. You have to have, there's like all these different models out there, like five different ways in which you get to competency. But what we do want to talk about is that the military cultural competency is important for us to push because that means there's a levels of systems change that has to be done in order to welcome, be a welcoming place where we understand one another, where the system is meant to provide support for you. And when those things are not there, what happens? We lose the opportunity to have really deep embedded connections with one another and really to ensure the health and well-being of our entire military connected community. Social networks is my jam. I love the whole thing around social isolation. And my counter to that is how embedded is your social network, which is basically your social capital, which is going to help you determine how you're going to get a job, how you're going to excel in a community, who might be your next, you know, special person in your life. And so if you're looking to expand the military connected community on campus, your social networks also need to be expanded. And isolation in your social networks will continue to create these barriers to enhancing what you're looking to build, which is often a military enhanced school. Um, so I'm gonna whiz through this part real quick, because again, in terms of psych armor, I want you to think about how this might align with your goals. As I've stated before, our vision is through education, we are enhancing the health and well-being and really quality of life of the entire military connected community. We do that through our education and training, which we're already starting to talk about. And one thing that I didn't talk about on the problem slide is something that I would also challenge all of you, just amongst your own peer groups, is that unique thing called cultural humility. And what I challenge when I like to talk to organizations that come to us with their pain points, and Shaban talked about this, and I think she might even jump in on this one too, but is to say, do you have the capacity to understand that you actually don't know everything that you need to know about one another. Mm -hmm. So even if you are all from a veteran community, your experiences are all uniquely dynamic to you. Mm -hmm. And if you build something based on just your experience alone, you're gonna miss supporting 
the people around you. So Shaban and I have talked about this beforehand. Do you want to jump in in terms of where this has been so impactful to ask that baseline yeah. question? So I want, I want to just put it out there, you know, with this cultural competency, you're not expected to be experts, first and foremost. And that's what I've shared with all of um, the trainings that we've done throughout the years is don't, one, don't get overwhelmed by all of the information that's out there. And, and two, don't get discouraged because you are not expected to be the expert. What this training does is to help position you to ask those important questions at the right time and in the way that will be the most effective. And you know, going back from isolation in your networks, I, you know, I was a veteran and I was married at the time. I was married to an active duty service member. I transitioned out and I thought, oh, well, I don't need to know anything about this military spouse life because I was a vet. I know everything I need to know. Man, was I humbled. It was an entirely <laughs> different world. And I was like, oh, gosh, this is hard too. Okay, I need to know where my resources are and I need to know my network and I need to, I'm asking different questions as a spouse than I was as a veteran. So going yeah. back to, yes. So, yeah, I feel that on a yeah. personal level. And that's also why we're staying really high level in this conversation with all of you, because it's not a matter of going through the 15 things right away. It's really encouraging you to advocate for yourselves as well, to say, like, we just want to make, make sure we understand one another. Um, it, I, I also love that during our times, we've been challenged to do that more, right? We've been asked, do you really know everything that you need to know about your neighbors? And the answer is, we have found out, is no. And that has caused great disconnect between each other. And these are, so these are like little skills that you can use even just amongst uh, people from different neighborhoods, different places. Uh, genuine connection is what we talk about coming from education. All of you are in the educational environment. How many of you are administrators or educators? Adele now may raise her hand. Awesome. <laughs> So you're getting this dual-hatted, right? You have that experience, you're in the system, you get this. Now you're at this place, and if you didn't believe so much in education, you wouldn't be where you are. So you understand the power of how just in planning a thought like, ooh, oh, I didn't know that. And to Shaban's point, you don't have to know everything. So our goal is always increase learners. That's how we start to like spread our little, our knowledge, enhance knowledge and skills, and reduce barriers to military culture education. I bring that up because in almost everything that you look from that, that other problem statement, when there's barriers to understanding that military culture, there's barriers to healthcare, there's barriers to education, there's barriers to employment. It, in almost every research you look at, it'll talk about the provider, whether that's you in academia or healthcare, et cetera, has like, it's, in healthcare, it's like less than 12% take military culture education. Anybody in healthcare, my mental health professionals? We know that that is a huge charge for us. Uh, my background in academia is military social work, so that's, that's where I've done a lot of my times. So we're gonna go, if you didn't know this, this is an action lab. Oh good, I'm actually doing time. really good on time. <laughs> Fantastic, I usually go longer. So if you didn't know it was an action lab, it's an action lab. It's like classic teacher on break, right? I'm gonna make you watch a video. <laughs> That's also why we're gonna do a survey. So you all have that, that piece of paper, um, three sheets of paper. We're gonna go there in just a second. Here's the reason why Shaban, this was never my idea by the way, it's all her. I'm just here to support her work. She's got like, I'm telling you, when she calls, I mean, the chancellor at UNC, the chancellor, like, are you kidding me? Sure, Siobhan, where do we go next? It's true because she's making the work happen. And so what's really important for us at Psych Armor is that when we do any source of education, even when we're doing videos online, we ask questions mm -hmm. because we need to make sure that the education that we're putting out there is hitting the mark based on the problems that we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. Remember how I said people will call us and they'll say, hey, we've got a problem over here. How do you help us fix it? Well, we're, we build education plans, but we don't always know if that's actually the problem that we are trying to fix. So we love to ask questions. So you're all a part of that process right now because you're going to fill out your pre-survey before you watch this video. Um, if you want to scan, you can scan. And then you're gonna do a post video, and then we're gonna break you out into groups, which I know seems kind of weird with COVID, and I was just thinking, I was like walking too close to you, I'm so sorry, but I promise I'm negative, and I just had my booster, and all that stuff, whatever. Um, anyways, so we're gonna ask you to have a conversation based on the questions that are in the lab. If anyone wants an extra sheet, you're also more than welcome to take, take these if you're gonna do, do something back, back at home base. Our cornerstone course that you've heard us um, talk about already is in our 15 things series. It was one of our first courses. 
and it's 15 things veterans want you to know. Now you're gonna go through that. Siobhan said she didn't, didn't wanna give away number one, but I have to now. The very first thing that we asked, number one, was we asked all of you that are from the veteran community, what do you want your community to know? What do you want your family members to know, your educator to know, your healthcare provider? We asked one question, we got back 15. We're about ready to redo this. I will call it out to say, we have another generation of amazing veterans that are coming out into this community. I am so curious to find out if the same 15 things are the 15 things. I'm gonna make some really broad assumptions. I don't think so. I think they're probably gonna be a little different. Maybe not. I think there's gonna be some baseline things there that are the culture that many of you understand to the core. They'll still be there, but I'm really excited. So this is gonna be my plug to say, we will look for dissemination partners when we go to, to, to put that research out there. If you wanna be a part of that, it's also such a great way to give an action item to that person that you're trying to influence. Like, hey, could we at least get this out there and find out what we learn about in terms of our community? This is the reason why I love 15 Things. Just so you know, there's a 15 Things series. And when we launched 15 Things Military Kids Want You To Know, we did it with Camp Corral and DAV. I have four military children. The best thing, first of all, was edit, listening to the edits in the video and my child walking in the room and saying, oh, hey, who's that? What's that? I'm like, oh, it's 15 Things Milk. Oh, yeah, 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 that sounds like me. And then walks out of the room, right? You're like, ah, oh, OK, the script's hitting the, hitting the mark. That um, video has been so wi widely disseminated and such a beautiful response because it's like voices at the table. We just heard that there's also military veteran spouses that actually were military kids, right? And so there's a new narrative that's being heard. And it's just been such a beautiful thing um, to see that community represented. We have 15 reasons to hire a military spouse. That was um, developed to also help articulate the military spouse unemployment and underemployment issues that we've had. This is the reason why I love it. I think it helps you ask my favorite thing, which is three questions deep, which is something that I also use when I'm teaching students around, um, and I say this from the, the academic lens, maybe suicide prevention techniques, whatnot. But how many times have we heard, if you ask a veteran, do you understand they're a veteran, and then we just say thank you for your service? This actually gives you that next chance to say, well, once you find out, number one, we aren't all soldiers. You then know to ask that question, did you serve? If so, what branch of service? And hey, what did you do? And then when they ramble off a number, you're like, huh, no idea. <laughs> Could you break that one down for me? Right? It is so powerful. Just how many of you know how to ask three questions deep? Even if your friend tells you they're not doing so well today and you're kind of like, ooh, don't know if I want to go into that one. So that's why I love this course because it helps you or it will help maybe even you help your friends ask three questions deep versus, you know, maybe just thank you and they can move on. So this is our ecosystem. This should look really familiar with education at the top. You guys are like the top of our entry point because look, healthcare providers come in through education, right? Communities come in through education and now employers, which is why I get to point out Adele in the room. She called me and said, I need to make sure that these employers are ready for the students that we're sending them. And so on Saturday, there will be a presentation with IVMF that's gonna release a survey around that really important connection of higher education and employers. So please make sure to check that out and we'll be releasing it through our channels as well. But if you influence one portion of this ecosystem with education and training just from a cultural piece, you're gonna influence that ripple effect system. I also wanna call something out. The center says veteran. I'm going to try to shift your narrative that please make that about the veteran's entire family system, their family, their children, their educators. You all are first line. You see things, right? And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we also educate you on what it might look like to be a caregiver. And then this is where I'm going to end before we go in and do 15 things. One of the unique things about Shaban's pledge um, to doing training was that she understood that it wasn't just about 15 things. It wasn't just about that cultural piece. Remember that systems change, that leading to cultural competency? It really is a learner's journey. I have educators in the room. You understand what that means. It's not a one and done. So we have an entire public health model 
of education on our website, but we also work with the experts in the field that we're constantly doing trainings or we're cultivating new content or we're doing work within their system to help them develop the training that they need. Food insecurity for military families, wait to see what's gonna happen with Military Family Advisory Network. They're like gonna come out hard with that message and they're targeting DOD leadership around education. So what I encourage you to do, if you look to embed any piece like Siobhan has, she started with culture, but then she moved on to what does, what do you need to know as administrative um, uh, personnel. Uh, if you, hi Jerry, I saw you come in before, but it was a mask. Um, <laughs> uh, we're also gonna say, do you know about that caregiver? Do you know about the family member? So one of the great things about that family system, how many of you have children or spouses that are benefiting from your GI Bill, right? Shaban has a tremendous example. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. I know so, I was. <laughs> so going back to my, my Wilmington days, I had um, a young student that was military connected. She was 19 years old. By all accounts, she looked and did fit the demographic of being a traditional student. However, she was using her father's GI Bill and she was married to an active duty Marine. And so she drove 45 minutes every day to campus to do her trainings. And so she was in our center all the time. Now, a lot of her professors just assumed that she was a traditional 19 year old student when in fact, she just found out during midterm she was expecting their first child. Oh, and by the way, her husband's getting deployed. So yes, don't, don't be deceived. We have uh, the, the, the subpopulation is so dynamic and so complex. Yeah. Yes. So being able to expand that entire system to look at not just for the sake of the veteran and the supported system for the veteran, but for everybody that we love and care about within our unique community. Some other places where we have seen academic partners come in and ask for training. Any of you involved with your state initiatives around a thing called the Governor's Challenge? Woo! One, two, four, North Carolina. three, North Carolina. So the Governor's Challenge is a large SAMHSA VA initiative around suicide prevention. But what you'll see is, you'll see that as they build out their stakeholder tables, don't we think that our, our academic institutions should be at that table? Mm -hmm. And they are, they're getting there. So um, North Carolina, they're, the military and veteran affairs, they're at the table. Yes, so the, the UNC system has a designated personnel to sit on the governor's challenge, suicide prevention challenge, and that has helped us get a grant, an emergency grant, um, to where we are getting 10,000 people within our, um, within our state to become mental health first aid instructors. Massive, right? Andrew, is he still in here? No. Okay, so anybody working in rural America? Okay, uh, there's a lot around health and telehealth and access. So we have worked with universities that access HHS grants around rural health, uh, sometimes VA grants with rural health. And if you're working with any level of provider, especially that might be in these, these uh, you know, socially disconnected communities, provider training is essential, even if it's just for your outreach plans. Any of you, or if you have institutions that are really big within opioid addiction and management, large HHS opportunities out there where we've trained nursing schools and medical schools. So those of you in the room that are veterans and family members, it's really important that every level or every door that you open, that that individual understands the world that you come from. I truly believe, and that's where Shaban has really shifted me, is that the university system is that first stop. Mm -hmm. and I, I do want to apologize. We were notified that right behind you oh, yeah. is, is a networking training session. So we will, we will try to speak loud, but that, that will only last for about five minutes. So just please be patient with that noise. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they said. They said Jared got mad at them last time, too. So we could, you know. All right. So we're going to move on to our action lab. Now, it might seem like, okay, a, a movie, but yeah, we're gonna be those kind of the instructors. We're gonna ask that you do what we, what we put out there in terms of call to action. Yeah, Lauren, were you gonna? Yeah.
Lauren. Um, yeah, and I, again, that's to your point, that's always been, you know, we, I, I, social work was one of the first ones that mandated the, the extra, the curriculum um, for social work. So I see that, my little shaking head there. So um, it's, it is, it's uh, it, in so many ways, and then you do the student services center and whatnot. So to Lauren, also just to back on Lauren up on this one, there have been things that have happened. So best practice model is here with Siobhan. There's also times where the training wasn't going anywhere. And so, right, remember that? Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the things that I encourage you to do, even if you do it on your own, is take this, take this video and create your own small group work and conversation, which mm -hmm. is what your action lab's gonna be, mm -hmm. okay? So we're gonna do, I ask just take 15 minutes, it's really 16, take 15 <laughs> minutes. This is something that you can do to increase your understanding for most of you since you have that Bit. It's also how you could implement training mm -hmm. into your existing practices, mm -hmm. as Siobhan has along the way with great success. So with that, to Tina, my YouTube friend. Tina, can I add one oh, thing? Oh, yeah. Please do, oh. do um, take the, the survey yeah, seriously, survey. Because, oh. because what we need um, from you is that learning piece of what it is that we could be doing, and it validates what it is, mm -hmm. the training that we're doing. But it will all, we're gonna share the results with you, and that's why it's really important for you all to participate in this. Because if you need to get that buy-in from senior level leaders, you're gonna have the data to back it up. Yes. Okay, all right. All right, I know popcorn. Boo. Oh, I get to sit down. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to 15 Things Veterans Want You to Know. My name is Dr. Heidi Kraft. I'm a clinical psychologist and the clinical director at PsychRammer Institute. I am a Navy veteran. I spent nine years on active duty in the Navy and deployed to Iraq in 2004 with a Marine Corps surgical company. I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce a new way of thinking about military culture. America is a country made up of people from countless different cultural backgrounds. Certainly, it's part of what makes us great. For some time now, people have been trying to understand what it means to be culturally competent. The military is a culture, just like any other. Military people, like those from any culture, have certain beliefs, practice certain rituals and traditions, and hold fast to certain ideals that shape who they are as a group of people. In order to bridge the gap between non-military Americans and those who wear the uniform of their country, military cultural competence is an important first step. So what are the most important parts of a culture to understand? Well, we went to the source. We asked our veterans. We asked thousands of American veterans, what is one thing you would want your doctor, nurse, therapist, employer, anyone in your life, really, who's trying to understand you, to know about you? This course is based on their top 15 answers. First and foremost, ask a very important question. Did you serve in the military? It matters and it begins the conversation. You see, in the military, we have our own history and our own language. In fact, if you listen to military people talk, it's truly as if they're speaking a different language. We have very specific traditions and they are richly written throughout history. They often tell you who we are. For instance, at a ball game, when the national anthem is played, you'll see military people standing at attention, even long after they've left active duty. We take pride in our sacrifices, and sometimes we feel like people who haven't lived our lives can't understand. So asking, did you serve in the military, is a great way to begin a conversation and to engage a veteran. As an active duty Marine said, we are not like you. The veteran and his family are tough, but have the biggest hearts. 
and have gone through huge sacrifices and a broad spectrum of emotions many times. Knowing that, please start the conversation. Ask a person if he or she served. If the answer is yes, let's move on to the 15 things veterans want you to know. Number one, we are not all soldiers. This is a big one for military people, and if there is one thing to take away from this course, it would be this. While many people, including those in the media, talk about military personnel, they refer to soldiers as a general term. This is not correct. Soldiers are only in the Army. There are four other branches in the armed services, and they are very different. They have different missions and even different subcultures. Although we are all part of that same larger team, military people are proud of their specific service branches. Very importantly, you do not need to know specifics about what the Coast Guard does, or what the ranking structure of the Air Force is, or what you call a person in the Navy. You don't need to know why the Marines' mission is different from the Army's. But knowing that these five branches are different is the first and important step to military cultural awareness. So this leads us to an important follow-up question. If a person answers yes, he or she served, the next question should be, which branch? Asking this question demonstrates that you know the difference between the five branches. I guarantee this earns you instant credibility with that veteran, and it keeps the conversation going, which is the whole point. Number two, the reserves are part of the military. There are two ways to serve in uniform in our country. One is active duty, in which case your full-time job is putting on the uniform and fulfilling your role in the armed forces every day. The other way is the reserves. These are people who train and stay ready to be called up if they're needed. Members of the reserves who are seen in every branch train together one weekend a month and two weeks a year. When not in uniform, they go back to their civilian jobs in their communities. They will be called to help when our country needs them, either to augment a national defense-related mission or, sometimes in the case of the National Guard, to help in domestic, national, or local emergencies where additional support is required. When reservists are mobilized and deployed, they come home from their deployments and go right back to their civilian communities. But often, they don't have the same support or resources as an active duty person does when they return. This can cause a significant amount of additional stress on military reservists and their families. Number three, not everyone in the military is infantry. When we think of the classic, generic version of the military person, we definitely think of infantry. This is an image probably fed through our culture from the time we're young. But the truth is, the range of what people do in the military is truly remarkable. We are expertly trained in literally hundreds of jobs, from mechanics, cooks, pilots, and sailors, to divers, administrators, doctors, musicians, to weapons specialists, military police, firefighters, and air traffic controllers. We operate, maintain, and fix all types of weapons, aircraft, sea vessels, vehicles, equipment, and machinery. Knowing this, the third important question to ask after learning a person served and in which branch would be, what did you do during your service? What was your job? This shows that you know there are many different things a military person could have been trained to do. It's an acknowledgement or a validation of that person's training and skills and how hard he or she has worked to be an expert at that job. It also demonstrates that you understand each individual job is vital to the overall execution of the military's mission. This will help you to consider the impact of different occupations might have, physically and mentally, in order to be sensitive to that in conversation. As one veteran explains, our bodies are pounded daily. By the time I hit retirement age, I will have lost several inches off my height due to daily stress. Number four, we have leaders at every level in the chain of command. Almost immediately out of basic or officer training, military people are responsible for those that work for and with them. And there's a sense of real leadership that's engendered, taught, and truly embraced all the way down to the lowest level of the chain of command and all the way up to the highest. Leadership is a very important factor in military service. Those who wear the uniform feel responsible for others and accountable to others. And this is a large part of the pride we take in our service. Number five we are always on duty. In the military, there are no days off, even when a person is on leave. 
We can be called back at a moment's notice if the unit is getting ready to deploy or in the case of an unexpected mission demand. So even when we're on vacation, we're not really on vacation. Here's a quote from a Coast Guardsman. I am always on call. I can never plan a vacation because an operation can come up at the last minute. Work schedules are pretty tough at times. Number six, we take pride in our appearance and in our conduct. Military people take appearance, conduct, and physical fitness very seriously. Even out of uniform, we're held to a standard with regard to how we look. Physical fitness matters in a real way. We need to train so that when we're called, we're ready to accomplish that mission. Likewise, we're responsible for maintaining a standard of conduct. In fact, active duty people are held to an actual code of military justice. It's a set of rules that governs military people, and we can be charged with crimes based on these rules and held accountable in court. Some people have perceptions about military people that maybe they're rigid based on the way they look. In fact, we like to think of ourselves not as rigid, but as proud. Simply stated, this is just the way we've been brought up, and we believe that these standards have a purpose. Number seven, we did not all kill someone, and those who have do not want to talk about it. This one doesn't need a lot of commentary. Unfortunately, this is a question that gets asked of our military veterans far too often. I realize people are just curious, but I hope this course will educate you to realize that this is not a question any military veteran wants to be asked, whether he or she has lived through this or hasn't. It's not a question that should be asked of military veterans. Please don't ask us that, ever. Number eight, we do not all have PTSD. There's a general perception that anyone who deployed to combat develops PTSD, and that's just not true. A vast majority of veterans, including combat veterans, do not go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people might have symptoms in the acute aftermath of any kind of trauma, but then experience a natural recovery process. This is also true for combat. While combat can certainly be very traumatic, it can also lead to great moments of reward and friendship and love. Number nine, those of us who do have an invisible wound are not dangerous and we are not violent. Invisible wounds of war, including post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, depression, and substance use disorder, are not obvious to someone looking at a veteran, but they are real injuries, causing real suffering, and they deserve the same respect and treatment as physical injuries. The media has created a bias that insinuates those with PTSD might be violent. This is not true. Those of us with invisible wounds of war may be injured, but we are not violent. Number 10, it is really hard for us to ask for help. The military culture is based in service, sacrifice, and helping, or even rescuing others. It is others-based, and historically has not valued self-care or help-seeking behaviors. There's an expectation of mission accomplishment, even at personal cost. Because of this long-standing cultural bias, reaching out for help for ourselves is difficult for military people. Some veterans view asking for help as a sign of weakness. It also takes a great level of trust for a veteran to allow him or herself to be vulnerable. Please have patience and don't give up on us. Number 11, our military service changes us. That change is permanent and that's okay. We wouldn't expect anything else. Like I said, it's a culture with its own traditions, rituals, language, standards, expectations, stigma, wonderful moments and horrible moments. It's unreasonable to think that a person will go through those experiences and be unchanged. Number 12, we differ in how much we identify with the military after we leave active duty. As in any culture, some people find themselves truly defined by their service and their association with the military. Others consider it part of their past and move on from it. If I'm getting to know a veteran, I like to ask these questions. How has your military service shaped you? How does it factor into how you define yourself now? Again, there's instant credibility in those questions as it gives us a chance to see that you understand. We are all different, both while we serve and after we serve. Number 13, our families serve with us. Military families have some of the most challenging jobs in the world. They're subject to frequent separation from their loved ones and moving from place to place, sometimes every two or three years. It's difficult to establish schools for the kids or jobs for the spouses. Then the service member comes back from deployment and wants to take back some of those responsibilities that he or she used to have. And the spouse feels like, you know, I've really got this process down. I know what I'm doing now. All of this requires flexibility, bravery, strength, and resilience. Anyone who knows a military family knows that all those words define us. 
Number 14, we would die for each other and we would die for our country. We would and we do. It doesn't matter where we fight, the geographical location or the technologic or political backdrop. It doesn't matter what the mission is or who's in charge of the country. Why we fight has always been the same from the very beginning. It's about the people to our left and our right, and any military person will tell you that. The people with whom we serve become brothers and sisters to us, and we would die for them, and we do. And we would not change that culture of sacrifice for the world. Number 15. We've all made this sacrifice for one reason, to serve something more important than ourselves. When it comes down to it, this defines our culture. People who choose to serve in uniform and who sign on that line, saying they will make that sacrifice, they live by a certain code. And we like to say it's honor and commitment and duty. Most of all though, these are people who make a choice. We've all chosen to serve something larger than ourselves, more important than ourselves. That's a unique and special piece of military culture that runs through everything and everyone who's part of it. We are choosing the concept of service. In summary, asking the right questions gives you credibility and brings you closer to the veterans in your lives. It opens the door for a better understanding of our experiences and our military culture. When you meet someone you think might be a veteran, ask, did you serve in the military? Which branch? What job did you do in the military? The military is a complicated culture and you do not have to know a lot of details about the military in order to show some military cultural awareness to bridge that gap between yourself and the veterans in your life. We hope this course has taught you a few important things that veterans want you to know. We're not all soldiers. The reserves are a vital part of the military. Not everyone in the military is infantry. There are hundreds of specific jobs people perform. Leadership is very important, and veterans have a heightened sense of responsibility for and to others. We are always on duty. We take pride in our appearance and our conduct. We did not all kill someone, and those who have do not want to talk about it. We do not all have PTSD. Those of us who do have an invisible wound are not dangerous and not violent. It's really hard for us to ask for help. We're used to putting others and the mission before ourselves. Our military service changed us. That change is permanent, and that's okay. We all differ in how much we identify with the military after we leave active duty. Our families served with us. Military families have some of the most challenging jobs in the world. We would die for each other and for our country. We've all made this sacrifice for one reason, to serve something more important than ourselves. Thank you so much for taking the time to take this course. I hope that this was helpful in better understanding military culture and our nation's veterans. On behalf of them all, thank you. Hey, what did everyone think about that? Yeah, thumbs up? Okay, awesome. Fantastic. All right, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. So because we are running a little bit short on time, what we are going to do is we're going to have you take your um, post-video questions now to take that survey for us. Um, you can either do it on the paper or you can do it really easy by scanning that QR code and just doing it online. We'll collect it through SurveyMonkey. Um, what we are going to do afterwards is we're not going to do the small uh, group discussion because we won't have time, but what Tina and I will do is after everyone has completed their survey, we're just going to ask the group as a whole, and then Lauren, can I ask you to maybe jot down some of the themes that you hear? Okay, fantastic. All right, well, uh, five minutes to take the survey? Yeah, yeah. Five minutes? That's Let all it. The, the fun things with COVID times. They have to be able to clear the room. And so it, also, if anyone wants to have conversation after, we'll head we'll be out of the room so that they can clear the room before the Clean next it. presenter. Yeah. So we just don't have that buffer like we used to have. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, here goes Lauren. Here she goes. I'm going to hop up while y'all are filling that out, because I can't help myself. If you have questions about grants through SAMHSA and the Governor's Challenge, if you have questions about opportunities to further your work at your schools, 
Tina, Siobhan, and I would love to talk to you afterwards. We're happy to give you our information, and we appreciate the time you're taking because, again, it will help us empower you at your schools. Thank you, Minnie. Minnie knows. <laughs> so cute. So, why she didn't get a Minnie Mouse? Um, mm -hmm. No ears. No ears. I don't know if that's true. I just made that up. <laughs> Sounded good. It smelled like alcohol before you came in here, not the drinking kind. All right, so just real quick, I'm going to see if anybody can be brave enough and would be uh, willing to just go through these round of questions. Does anyone want to offer maybe what's one thing that you learned in this action lab? Anybody? Lauren can't raise her hand. Hi. Thank you. I have to, to congratulate you on, on adopting that language because language is incredibly important. And um, where I'm at right now, we have a student veterans center, and we are in the process of getting a new building, and we are going to try and name that to be more inclusive. Yeah, inclusive language. Who gets to work intensely in that? It means everything, right? It's whether or not you see yourself, and in many ways, in that room. Anybody else? Have anything to offer on what you might have learned? Hi. Thank you for that. So one of the things that we've also done to restructure, we were, had some classes called Military Culture 101 and 102. And we, as a group, came up and said, wait a second. We're not even sure if this is culture. It's also identifying the lack of knowledge that people have in our own military structure, civic education. Big conversation for us right now. And so understanding that there's X amount of branches of service, which did anyone catch? Uh, we gotta say Space Force. That's another reason why this has to be redone. In every room I go in, there's a Space Force representative. Who's with Space Force? Ah, not this room. Uh, so really important, but it's also important because we believe that your voice, your community, will be a very strong community to build trust back around our, our government, around democracy, around the system and the purpose for the military in many ways. Um, so yeah, it's, it's also increasing a level of just baseline knowledge since Schoolhouse Rock isn't on our Sunday morning programming anymore. Who misses Schoolhouse Rock? I do. <laughs> yeah, right? You learn everything. How a bill gets passed. Like, yeah. Anything else before I really get kicked out? So, um, so two things. Anybody have anything immediately that they're going to do after this action lab that they want to throw out there because you won't feel good about leaving if you don't get to tell the group? 
okay? Maybe go online and sign up so you get some of our stuff that's gonna be coming out. I'll give you one. Um, and then, again, institutional leadership. I really do, I, I'm, I'm a bottoms up kind of gal, and when I meet people like Shaban, she reminds me that you can sometimes get huge systems change quickly if you go to leadership at the top. So again, whichever area you have to influence, it all counts. Um, just, you know, tackle it on where you are, and uh, that can also be some of your, your action from here, depending on where you sit. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, by your hand, do you feel like your university is military student connected ready? Oh, God. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were going to say no. Wow. Our, yeah, our military, okay. Um, some, some things that have been helpful for me in the past is to find an ally. Um, uh, what helped with us at UNC Wilmington was that we had our Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs who um, came from a military background um, but was not herself a veteran. And having um, coffee with her and, and sharing with her some of the data, specifically NVEST, which you can find on studentveterans.org under their research, um, talking about you know the value of a military student um, that, that's the business case 101. Get the buy-in from there. Why, why is having a student veteran chapter important? Why is even caring about the veteran or military connected student important? And then you can say, hey, by the way, we have data that shows taking this research can actually make our entire campus better and will help with retention, graduation rate, and overall success. Remember at the end of the day, in I, I hate to say this in front of veterans or, or students, I mean, at the end of the day, we're in the business of educating. So you have to come at it through the business lens. You have to sell them the ROI, like, like Lauren said. And if you can show them that your military students will have a better overall experience, military students go a lot by word of mouth. So if you had a good experience at your school, your friends are more likely gonna go to your school. That's the benefit from it, so keep that in mind. Once you have a good ally who can help open those doors for you, um, somebody that you should really seek out is your um, HR representative. Mm -hmm. So your talent acquisition person and get their buy-in so that anybody that's onboarding, any new faculty, staff, administrators, they know about this resource and they're either highly encouraged or they are required to take the, take the training. So those are some things that have been really helpful. Yay. Okay. Any questions before we get kicked out? Yay. We have one in the back. I'm guessing this thing works, right? Yeah. Uh, so my name's Alex. Um, so I have allies on campus um, at the, the dean level. Uh, however, uh, my direct uh, supervisor is the VP for enrollment management. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in a very off-the-cuff way, I've been told that veterans are not his priority. So what would be a suggestion or a workaround? Because it seems like there is support uh, for the initiatives that we have on campus, um, but if the buck stops with him, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to get fired, you know, um, if, I'm, if I'm starting fires to the left and right. The one thing that I, I will share is that, and again, I, I'm so sorry if students are in this and I have to talk about the business part of it, but the best way to share about it is you are getting research data driven information that shows that military connected students um, perform higher than their non-veteran peers. They um, are more likely to be engaged leaders, both on and off campus. They're more likely to give back to their communities, and they're more likely to give back to their university after they graduate. And oh, by the way, they come with their own money. They bring in submit. I, I would challenge any university to, to no longer accept the GI Bill. That university would be closed down. They, they could not sustain it. That's to too many millions upon millions of dollars for your school. They should be a priority. I'll add to that. Veterans attract donors. Yes. Okay? It's not just the G I 
is from, you know, my perspective, like I told you what we believe in, we work from a place where organizations come to us with their pain points, yes. and it's always a business case, which is any of you going into nonprofit management, where it is that business part, it's an uncomfortable part, so you don't want to have to talk to about it that way, but any of you going into policy, you know that when you go and advocate for legislation, it's because you need to get stuff done, it's the same thing, right? And so, yes, from the university's business system. So we don't have that on our website, but we're learning as well that in order to create the change that we need to, we have to look at it from that lens, which of course is why we have Lauren, because she reminds me every day. But yeah, it's a different, it's, it's, it's a hard one, right? Because it's a win-win, Yes. you have to prove it through yeah. um, actual data. That's right, yeah. And so uh, you, could look, you can look at federal money, um, how much money your university gets through federal dollars. Um, the VA, I can't. Yeah. The wants, the VA wants. Thank you. I was drawing a blank. Um, and then you can also, let's see. Go use. I'm sorry. Just an iPad Thank you. But you, can, I'm thinking re, for research, and because when we have to influence academic folks, we need we need peer-reviewed research, right? Um, Really, if you haven't done so already, spend some time on Student Better Than America's website under their research tab. They have been to, Dr. Chris Cade has been doing great work with this research. Um, I know Envest is a little outdated. It was published in 2015 or something like that. So I'm hoping that more data will be coming out soon with new research. But, you know, they're just do your, do your research. You're going to find that information is out there and time and time and time again. Research shows we perform well and we bring in good money to the school. So you mentioned money, but we were surprised uh, two years ago when we went to the conference. Post 9 11 GI Bill has completely changed the game on how much money universities get from the GI Bill. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was it? Seven and a half million dollars. It, it, it went years. from like $100,000 to seven million. So when we showed our university, just, 1, students. Wow. just it, it's yeah. incredible, and people don't know that. And so when you show them now those numbers, it has a huge impact. It's like, holy cow, that's how we got our veterans center. They were like, oh, yeah. okay. Oh, oh, and another thing, better, better to military connected students are more likely to vote. So if you tell that to your legislators, your city officials, you're going to get five million from them as well. So we need money for a center. We need money for an initiative like these grants are we vote. So that makes a big difference. If any of you wrote on because I'm gonna I'm looking at my friend over there that I promised I'd get on. <laughs> if anybody has the, the survey, please bring it back to me if you wrote on them. I'll that, like okay, the yep, at the door. And we'll go outside if anyone wants to have a continued conversation. Yes. Good? And we need our, our photos. Oh yeah, we do.